They do it. They they do the same thing in NFL. I I understand why it's trying to kind of bring more sort of awareness to it, more audience participation. But it is it's a bit it's a bit too much, and we just probably want to say you should probably just stop and like you can give us something else, or at least do all the skills challenges or something. You know. Yeah. So. The skills challenges I like. Yeah, I mean the skills cool. skill challenges are fun, but I think you probably kind of stop there because once you don't tackle in a game, it does it doesn't really matter because yeah. who cares at this point? And welcome to the Down and Front Podcast, the official podcast of downandfrontpodcast.com. dot com. I am your host Warren. I am with my best friend Brylin. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going this evening? It's going this afternoon. Uh, but you know, evening, afternoon, we you know we. We're, we're here. It's the same. We're excited. Yeah, it's the same. moving around. How, how are you doing on this earth today? Boom. There we go. Uh, uh, I'm doing well. Good. good. Uh, we're excited. We're pumped. It's just going to be me and Brylin tonight uh, and today. What we're going to be doing is we're talking about a Netflix movie that just actually released on Friday called A Futile and Stupid Gesture, direct, directed by David Wayne. Uh, stars a bunch of people. Uh, but mainly it's going to be Will Forte, um, Damo Gleason, and a bunch of other artists and actresses. We're going to get into that, kind of unpack this a little bit, and really say why everybody should be watching this movie and watch it and come chat with us about it. So we're pumped. We're excited to talk about it. I'm going to toss it over to Brylin, as we normally would say is, well, uh, Brylin, I just saw you for our Oscar conversation. So what else have you been watching? And uh, what are you sipping on today? Uh, recently, what I've been watching a lot of is the Overwatch League. And this is the new professional sports league for Overwatch video game players uh, that they have, where they're kind of tailoring it after regular sports teams like NFL, uh, MLB, where there's actual cities with teams and jerseys and names and slogans. And I find it to be a lot, very exciting and a lot of fun. Um, This past weekend, Boston, uh, the Boston Uprising, actually had two come from behind wins. To actually get them into the upper tier brackets of higher hopes of making the playoffs, uh, just like another Boston team, the New England Patriots. Boo! We didn't need to talk about football at all. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But um, it's a lot of fun. It's exciting. I would encourage someone to watch it, even if they never watched anything like this before, because I think they are close to making... Something where anybody can tune in and still make sense of what's going on. Yeah, the action is fast-paced and everything, but after a few rounds or so, you start picking up, like, why is someone's uh, special move good in this position versus uh, this guy's defense and what makes them really good at what they're doing. Uh, And I hope, like, these players start to get some notoriety, too, out of this. Uh, But definitely check it out. It's uh, Twitch, twitch.tv slash Overwatch League. And they always play their games, I think, Wednesday through Saturday nice. every week. Yeah, I had a um, great time like, with hanging out with you and Mocha, uh, just watching that because I was working late or doing something late. Um, and I was just watching it, put that on like the side on, just watch it, had a good time. Like I've never played the game before. I've probably only seen you play it on a Gamecast. But just being able to see that, I was like, man, these people are not only in this, which I can get into video games, that's fine. But just seeing like how communication and everything, like it arguably, you know, what – I would say I would watch the Overly Watch League more than I'll watch the Pro Bowl or the NBA All Star. So <laughs> that's I mean that's that's only a kind of a fair comparison of one is pretty competitive and the other one is just isn't. Right. Yeah. And what I'm sipping on this afternoon is uh, I got myself a venti iced americano from the Starbucks down the street. Uh, they were out of cold brew, but this has become my backup drink. Uh, I'm definitely. Trying to be a little bit more health conscious about what I put into my body. I do love coffee, but I don't want to get a mocha that's full of milk or a macchiato that's got tons of milk in it. So, Americano, espresso over water, not bad. That's really good. There you go. Yeah, so what you're saying is that, like everybody in the world, you also don't like mocha. Yeah, I've I've actually divorced my love of mocha and gone to 
Americano. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so just set the register straight. Bryland does not like mocha. That's okay. Yeah. Neither do I. <laughs> well, always great to have you. I miss your face, but I'm excited that we can always kind of still chat, um, still kind of review these movies. Um, hopefully I get a chance to kind of hang out, come out to uh, California and we can party up. So uh, be stay tuned for that. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm your host, Warren. Uh, I'm hanging out. And what I am currently, what I've been watching, I've actually, from our last conversation, I went and watched Mudbound. Um, it's on a Netflix movie. And I think it actually got a chance to uh, be nominated for uh, cinematography. And uh, and also Mary J. Blige got nominated for, this is for Oscars, she got nominated for Best Song and also a Supporting Actress. Uh, and just kind of going off of the conversation that we had before, th- this movie's solid. Didn't realize it was a period piece, though. So the moment that I saw that, I'm like, oh, you know, these two families is going to be... you're not a fan of period pieces, oh, are you? Oh, no. no I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't care too much about it. I just want to yeah. know, like, what the, like... How are you going to be actually, like, we've seen this before, right? So if we've seen this movie before, what are you going to be bringing into this movie that's a little bit different, especially if it's based on a book or a novel or something like that? And so that's something I was more focused on. And otherwise, like, I'm also looking at all these Oscar nominees, nominations, these movies, and seeing that, you know, Garrett Hundley could have been easily uh, put into this actual sort of supporting actor. And things like that, love. There could have been other. There's there's other things that we can actually see that just didn't necessarily happening. But the movie's solid. It is a period piece, but I would definitely suggest it and recommend it because just like a futile and stupid gesture, it's on Netflix. If you have an hour, a couple hours to kind of spend and really look at some good cinema, especially the cinematography and the costuming is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and just some of the things that it brings up in the movie, it's some things that we still kind of deal with today. And I think it's going to be timeless, right? We always will deal with, deal with people just being different. Uh, but I love the fact that they have two different sort of visions of one, this is what America was like at the same time. And the other, this one was everywhere outside of America, right? And when you can bond over the fact that, hey, we're fighting this war, there's something there. And whether it's PTSD or, um, you know, stress and anxiety of all these things is kind of all bundled up into this movie that aren't necessarily kind of explored too much. But people, two people fighting a war, they can actually bond over something. And that you, that's even further than what race could happen in like racism and things like that, I think is a very important sort of story to tell. Um, and I'm glad that they did do a lot of things that were different, kind of fucked up, but very different. So definitely go check it out. It's called Mudbound. That's going to be on Netflix. Uh, and I am still currently sipping on my Whiplash Red one very smooth uh, it's very easy to drink so i'm definitely trying to uh not go out of the house again <laughs> uh and at least kind of read uh drink this while i'm reading my books so yeah. that is what I'm, really, I'm watching yeah i'm really interested to see uh take the time to watch my ballot as well because i think it takes place during reconstruction period as mm-hmm. well yeah which i mean is, is essentially the american dark ages there's not much historical record about how were things like during that time and it's very tough to like paint a picture of that. So anything that gives us insight to uh, to us for that period of time is really important. I think. Um, one question I would have for you: Do you think Mary J. Blige is deserving of that nomination? No. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it, it, we, we don't have to go into it too much, but yeah. her her character was very very much a side character to the point where she probably had two or three scenes. So to tell me that. You put Mary J. Blige as a supporting actress up there with like, Alice and Janney and um, Octavia Spencer. I, I, I don't think that's that, that's not kind of balanced at all at, at, at any point. Uh, she was a supporting actress, yes. But to tell me that all these other people that was already kind of looked over and we talked about this a little bit, to put Mary J. Blige in it, like, I wouldn't necessarily kind of put her up there. But, you know, a, original song could be. She could win it for that, but... I, I wouldn't necessarily put, do it for, for the uh, Best Supporting Actress. Interesting. Yeah. So that is what I've been watching. That is what we've been drinking. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is A Futile and Stupid Gesture, directed by David Wayne, which I know you love him, and yes. Blewett loves him, and Mocha loves him. For some strange reason, I'm the only person that doesn't really like his work, but arguably I just think that's the... Um, What's the name of the summer camp movie? The Wet Hot American Summer yeah. Series. Not a yeah. fan. Not a fan. But I tried. I had, I you tried. Try. I, I watched it. And I think I think even before like I watched it with Dylan. And I said, you know, this is not for me. I don't I don't think this is for me. But it's it's funny. I can see why people like it. But it's just not for me. 
Uh, but definitely kind of going into this movie, uh, there was a couple things that I was looking forward to, especially because I had no idea anything about the movie. So let's start this and say, Brylin, what are a couple of things that you knew or you were excited just to learn and see and put them on film of this actual movie? Uh, well, I would say National Lampoon definitely helped build my love of comedy when I was younger. Um, I'm too young to have been in into the magazines but those movies like animal house caddyshack uh later on you'll have like uh, national Lampoon's foods loaded weapon one and national Lampoon's foods vacation movies uh they were definitely the movies that i loved and cared about and i love the goofy antics they had but is also they're very adult comedies but also you can have fun if you're a kid at it too and it's like that nice little thing that um it was kind of the thing that my parents let me see that was kind of taboo and they didn't really mind it because they were enjoying it at, at the same time, just for different reasons than I was enjoying it. Um, but um, I watched a documentary on Netflix last year called uh, Drunk Stone Brilliant Dead, which is all at the creation of National Lampoon. That actually opened up my eyes a little bit about how impactful uh, their, the, the, scope of the comedy and the type of comedy style that they built influenced future generations like your Apatow films or Revenge of the Nerds or even going into just like the branching off of seeing people like Bill Murray and Chevy Chase start to do their own things and how they kind of kept the spirit alive through their own creations as well. So it's definitely interesting to see the beginning of all this comedy genius that and how it's actually percolated through um, our culture. Yeah, that was, um, I went into this movie blind and I'm pretty sure there's, uh, some, some wins and some, you know, I have a different stance completely, uh, because the fact that I had no idea what this movie was about, but I love, and I think we said, I was like, I know who the director is. I love Will Forte. I love Dom Gleason. Uh, and this guy talk about, both of, like Will Forte and Domo Gleason's range is out of this world, especially Domo Gleason right. because Peter Rabbit. That's a couple of question marks there, but going back to have a <laughs> Star Wars, you know, to being about time to uh, he's arguably one of my favorite sort of actors. Yeah, uh, and I, Harry I Potter. Think, so there you go. Yeah, yeah. This movie kind of seals the deal that um, I'm a Domo Gleason fan now. I mean, <laughs> this wow. Um, maybe next year an Oscar nomination. I mean, I would love to see that for him for this role. This is an amazing. When we were talking about understated roles, yeah, it's a very understated role, but it has that power to I, it as well. I mean, I can see like I can. And he's it, unrecognizable. Yeah, if they were to, you know, if they were to put this on as a nomination, like I, I, the only thing I can see is put him on the best supporting actor. Um, right. That would be. That would be awesome. I, I I would love it, especially because this is an early 2018 movie that's directly straight to Netflix. So I'm wondering like how they feel, but just like Mudbound, right? Mudbound went directly to Netflix and that has some nominations. So it definitely has some hope. Um, I would I would love I would love that as much as possible. That'd be pretty cool. Right. Um, but yeah, went into this movie blind and this was awesome. So me not knowing anything about it, just knowing the fact that you know Will Forte plays in you know. Um, the Last Man on Earth, which is one of my favorite TV shows, and all the stuff I just said about Donald Gleason, I was all f for it. I was all excited about it. I was just definitely a bit nervous because a Wet Hot American Summer is not my kind of comedy, and so I was interested to see what other kind of films that uh, David Wayne could make, uh, and I was very much uh, surprised and very en entertained from this movie, so this is definitely good. So, let's get into it. Let's talk about our wins. Let's talk about our wins, criticisms, then we're going to sign off a little bit and tell you all about all of our amazing things that we do here at the Down in Front Podcast. Uh, but, Brylin, talk to me about some wins for this movie. Uh, so, yeah. So, some of my wins, I mean, I would say Will Forte and Domino Gleason definitely deliver on this relationship between Doug Kenny and Henry Beard on the creation of the National Lampoon and one playing the very wacky, like, very hopeful uh, erratic guy, Will Forte, but also his very haunted and damaged as well at the same time. And he's able to balance that really well in his acting. Uh, and then Donald Gleason is this very straight man that he wants 
to have fun. And he, even though you don't see him express it, he's having fun until it stops being fun. And I think that's a really important thing about this is um, it's all about the about the journey of creating something on your own. And when when does it stop being yours and become something else? Mm-hmm. But also, how do you continue to be relevant when something that you created becomes bigger than you are? Mm-hmm. And you see both ways you can handle this, where it's like, all right, I'm happy and content with what uh, what I've created, and I'm going to walk away on Henry's side. And then Doug is, I still need this, and I don't know how to do it, and it leads down a dark path. And I um, would say uh, we will be spoiling this movie. Yeah. So keep in mind about that, uh, because there will be things that we do talk about that arguably, even though a lot of people look at it as, oh, it's not a you know motion picture, like huge release. There's still a lot of spoilers to be had, especially if you aren't, uh, aren't aware of the story like I was. So keep in mind, we will be t- spoiling this movie. But going off of that point, Brylin, I think the one of the best ways to kind of see that is, you know, you literally woke up overnight and you have like all this money and this huge fame and all this stuff is awesome. But you also have this entity that's way bigger than yourself that you can't even sort of like recognize. So the fact that you see him drive up to his parents' huge mansion, right? With a yeah. Porsche. And the the line that he gives is like, oh, dad. <laughs> Carrying goats. Yeah. He said, you know, the uh, dad said that he had too lo- long of a line. So I just gave you two goats. And I'm like. Well, who does that? But I, I love the I, like. There's a lot of different layers and a lot of different levels of the comedy there that um, I'm really glad that they kind of put in this movie because we get a, a bit of a slice of life of really what uh, what it takes for some of these people um, to create such amazing work. Yeah, and his relationship with his dad is very interesting. I mean, you see it from his childhood up until um, Doug's uh, mysterious death uh, when he's 33. That um, and what you see, what people said, it, I mean, they, I hope they actually recreated the funeral kind of based on word of mouth of people that were there, because I thought it was great to see that his dad was very overbearing, very critical and everything. I mean, when he's coming up to his brother's funeral as a little kid, um, his dad saying, I don't care if he gets out of the car can join us as not his mom's trying to get him to get come out of the car Mm -hmm. that kind of like becomes a chip on his shoulder throughout his life uh and those moments like when he comes up to the house he bought for them and his dad's just like not impressed by any of it um up until like he's drunk and he goes to the press briefing for caddyshack and he's just shitting on his own movie he created and his dad's there it's like you wanted us to be here um and you're fucking it up right now heartbreaking Um, heartbreaking but then at the very end at his funeral was like his dad looks around is like so many he made so many people happy yeah and i don't think it's i think it's very deep about that parental relationship is like yeah you're gonna get criticism you're gonna get things and some parents are overbearing it doesn't mean they don't love you though and I think that's one thing that can actually um, – that that's tough for Doug in this place that w- when we talk about like his mental capacity and his mental ability to handle things is that he can't get past that for some reason. Mm-hmm. I think Will Forte does a great job of expressing that as well. Yeah, I mean uh, uh, this movie implements a very interesting tool – Yes. Uh, by way of narration that I've never quite seen before. Um, have you seen... So, what they do is they have a narrator. So yeah, they they have a narrator that's breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead. Oh, go. You're much better. And, yeah, and um, and it's Martin Mole playing a future Doug Kenny. Uh, and all throughout, he's breaking the fourth wall to tell you funny things like, yeah, these actors don't look like the real ones, but who gives a fuck? Or in the middle of the movie, they, um, they have a rolling credits of things <laughs> that are actual accurate details. They never left in the movie. And then I, I stopped and read everything. And it even spoils 
parts of the movie going forward from that point. Nice. If you stop and read it. But at the very end, it says, if there's any other inaccuracies you actually see in this movie, email them to we don't give a fuck at fuckyou.com, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is perfect for this style of humor. Um, and, uh, and he plays it really well where he's just talking about, uh, I mean, how Doug, I mean, loves his life, loves what he does, is having fun. Um, and then at the very end, and he, they even use it for like, uh, social criticism you would have about the National Lampoon. One of the best parts is two black people walking down the street and they're saying, wait, you only have one woman and no black people on your staff. It's like, it's a different time. Um, Mm -hmm. and he he goes like, you're right. We didn't know any better. (laughs) I'm glad that they did that just to, um, say, Hey, we, we did what we thought was, the best for us and yeah. hey guess what we're white people and all we know is white people stuff yeah and it's good that they called that out and at the very end even when um old doug kenny is talking to uh recently demise doug kenny saying like hey you made a lot of white people happy and hey if that's what he did then so be it i think it's a very earnest approach to this type of um the to this Storytelling, because we're talking about uh, a magazine that was about not holding back and expressing their vi- views and their viewpoints and opinions on politics and society and culture uh, with uh, no filters and no um, no type of um, like polish on it at all. It's very raw, very rough, very in your face, mm-hmm. and it's good. And it, you would see think. Like something that come out like this today it would actually be a societal upheaval, and like they probably get Twitter, um, like a Twitter mob against them and stuff, and not be in business for long. Uh, but it's really cool to say, like, hey, for us to explain this story, we got to actually admit our faults too, and I really appreciate about that. I just love, like, even for some of the things that you said there, I love the fact that they're, you know they really, really kind of turned it up and kind of showed a bunch of jokes how they just really didn't care. They didn't give a shit of what they actually said. Like, they're saying things like the majority of the comedians, and I think we talked about this before, of, you know, Dave Chappelle kind of mentioned this of, uh, arguably, right? I'm not saying this because I believe in it. I'm just saying that because it's funny. And they really went in so they can see, like, the round table, and they're just kind of throwing out these jokes. And says, no, there's no bad idea. And they're throwing out a bunch of jokes, and they're, like, some pretty, pretty shitty ones and pretty terrible ones, too. Um, but I liked that you can actually see a bit, like, a behind the scenes. Because then when the... I can't remember what his name is right now, but he kept popping out the office and says, we're being sued by this. We're being, sued, we're being sued by Disney. We're being sued by this. It was a great moment to see about how much fun they actually was having to not only be actors, but being the director and actually kind of show something how they try to emulate and imitate how much fun they were having even back then. Um, so I just, I'm glad they actually kind of used that tool. I'm glad they kind of went there. And I'm glad that even this movie itself, which especially with all the stuff that we're going on with politics and Twitter and all this stuff, like they can still come out with a movie that says, arguably, we are here for comedy. Uh, we're here for social shat- satire. We don't give a shit. Uh, if it hurts your feelings, too bad, really, because you definitely need to get a bit, bit of a thicker skin. And me being a super emotional person, I was like, hey, that's that's really awesome. And I like at least that message that they are sending there. Um, so that was awesome. Uh, I, th- I think another big win for me is probably Will Forte's character. I would even say as a, as a whole of the, the casting entirely. Um, I felt like, you know, the main characters looking at Donald Gleason and Will Forte was just h- hilarious. And uh, even to the point where when uh, he's like, Will Forte goes into the office and they were talking about how they need to be bought out. And so you need to buy them out of their contract. And he's, Forte jump, jumps up on Ask Kenny and like kicking things off the desk and doing all this stuff. And you see Henry's character or the Donald Gleason's character like just knocks <laughs> just a picture. Yeah, just picture knocks a picture off. I'm like, that, <laughs> come on. That's like very, very funny because you're trying to like still be those same people and those same characters. So I thought that was uh, I thought that was a lot of fun. You know, I had a great time. And it's really arguably, uh, I think one of the reasons why I love this even more is you have a bit of this dark comedic sort of um, undertone that's happening here of 
at this time when I was watching this movie, I did not know that he had died. He had passed away. And then when you give me a narrator from the modern day that's talking as if he's still alive or had died later on, at least we'll see the narrator's part. It really messes with my mind because I'm like, oh, okay, well, he's going to come back. So we'll figure something out. We'll see. And it really took a turn of when he goes in, get checks out. I think it was, I don't know if they went to Hawaii for rehab or just kind of get away from something. But, yeah, he went to Hawaii from rehab, but okay. as you see when you bring Chevy Chase along with you, <laughs> that doesn't last very long. Just one ball, right? <laughs> just one tennis ball? Yeah, just one tennis ball. So much cocaine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then from there, I didn't, I was like, I was shocked. And then I was hooked because it's like, how are you going to end this movie? I didn't even realize he had died. And then I went back and looked and, you know, sure enough of, you see the uh, the things that actually happening and... Um, I just love that, you know, this is, you know, a true story. It's a, a bit of an undertone because a lot of people would know how this story ends. But at the same time, just like this National Lampoon, they didn't give a shit. Like, you have to be comfortable with everything, right? You can't always be comfortable with, like, making fun and kind of talking about jokes that doesn't really hurt people's feelings. They, it really kind of uh, has to do a broad strokes of saying that, hey, you have to be comfortable talking about everything. Life, death, politics, sex drugs everything and i love that they just packed jam-packed everything into this movie wasn't afraid of talking about it wasn't afraid of showing that this guy you know there was even jokes back then of like did he slip or did he actually fall when he committed suicide or was it like an accidental thing of they went there and um i think you know a lot of people arguably could be offended from this movie but i think that was the point um, not for the fact that you should be offended but the fact that hey i'm going to tell this story and we're going to tell this story and if you feel bad or not like that's really on you and sorry we still have the chance we still have the right to tell this you know because it's going to be funny and it's an important story to tell um and even the fact that you know you have how uh he got really upset watching tv watching saturday night live and the fact that he's like this this is my this is what i created and that was really kind of hurtful too because you even before that you started to see that he has um a, a couple of things going on with him like internally and that he definitely needed to work some stuff out, work some stuff out. And he had a sense of never me, me, being able to make his father proud. And they put those scenes in of uh, his father saying that, you know, he's never good enough. The wrong son, the wrong son died. And like all these things that well, we'd have no idea what was going on in the real um, Kenny's head. But at the same time, like some people that's probably close to them may have known uh, to the point where I don't know if it was his wife at this time, but uh, his second love interest was his wife. Uh, Catherine. Catherine, yeah. Emmy Russell's character. Yeah, was that his yeah, wife? She was really good too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but she and she like you, you need you need to get you need to talk somebody you need to talk somebody and he says, and he says a line you know this is way back at the actual um, rehab facility of you know I'm not good at this I'm not good at relationships I'm not good at like talking this stuff out but she kept persistent she was per- per- very persistent about it um, and that's something that's very important to see we don't know what happened we don't know if he actually did in real life or not I don't know I don't think anybody will ever know but at least having uh, that message put in the movie also right it's not just all fun and games at the same point, some people's lives probably are ruined, got hurt and everything. So they even put that into the movie. I really like that because it really gives you a, a like a realistic approach of, you know, shit's crazy in L.A. Brylin, be careful, man. Shit's crazy in L.A. Just, <laughs> My so. West Coast will eat you up. Yeah, I know. Eat you up and spit you out. Um, so but, um, it, I love the fact that it was like a mockumentary slash documentary slash, you know, a, a dramatic movie but it's also a, a, a like a, a it was a bit of a call to action from a lot of different things right but at the end of the day like be yourself and I, and I, and, I, and that's at least some of the 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 message that I got from it and that's really one of my biggest wins that I loved about it yeah and um I would say uh also I did really like Emmy Rossum in her uh portrayal I haven't seen her in many things but I always hear that she's really good on Shameless and it was, and I thought that she was fantastic as kind of being the person in Doug's life at that time, mm-hmm. the only one that actually cares about him, and that it comes over as critical at times, but and it kind of gave him probably some neurosis about how his father was criticizing him and 
to have the person he loves the most do the same thing probably was heartbreaking at the same time, but it's coming from a good place. He just doesn't realize it. Um, I also think um, along with the narrative devices they use, um, using his own comedy creations to kind of uh, show his breakdown happening, where it's the panel of him cheating on his first wife with Mary Marshmallows and how that plays out. Mm -hmm. That was very like earnest and heartbreaking to see um, and very sad, but also in the middle of shooting Caddyshack, Bill Murray does his little nightclub nightclub singer uh, act from SNL, which um, was basically like him kind of thinking like, all right, they've stolen everything from me, and now they're just telling me how terrible I am. Mm-hmm. And that was also a very, I thought, was really well done. Also like that, uh, his life kind of ends the way it, kind of started for him like his life if we look at it his life only begins when he's at the harvard lampoon and starting with that food fight and that book release and everything and at his funeral they harry ends up starting a food fight and that's how so the movie ends uh. it's like a great food fight and his uh at his funeral and his parents are joining in and everybody's having fun yeah that was uh, i'm glad because i think you know i probably one of the few people that saw Animal House and Caddyshack way, way too late. Uh, I think like maybe sometime in college or something, like maybe after college. Um, but like watching these movies and like then put like having them put like certain scenes and certain things in those movies and seeing like the, the like the backstory of like the stuff that's happening, especially about the gopher and uh, with Caddyshack and uh, that was it, it was nice and it was able to kind of like peel peel away a couple different layers of what exactly was happening because, you know, he's having this crazy party uh, at his new house in Malibu, I think, and everybody's already there and they're having a good time and then suddenly Catherine shows up like, I was waiting at the airport for two hours and they get into this argument and you can see that he just physically can't handle it so he kind of recluse like goes back to what's comfortable to him and he literally starts writing and he starts working and starts writing and i believe after that that's when caddyshack came out shortly after that i gotta check check a look into that one but um you you tend to do things that you feel so uncomfortable that you have to like revert back to like what makes you feel as comfortable as possible that's it was kind of a tough it it was still funny of how they actually did it of like you see him kind of open up like you want to see what two two thousand uh you want to see what money can buy here's two thousand dollars worth of cocaine and you see uh <laughs> Chevy Chase character goes up throws the plate away and just starts scooping it with a spoon I mean like this is like like the <laughs> the physical comedy of like the small things that they were put in this movie which is so good and it was just so funny yeah. um and I would give a shout out to Joel McHale. I mean, yes. He played a great Chevy Chase. Like, oh, oh my gosh. Getting the, like when he walks into his parents' house and just starts, says, I'll pour you a drink and does the whole Pratt Falls and everything that Chevy <laughs> Chase does. It was, it was fantastic. I just love that. He's like, yeah, uh, the Chevy did that every time. Like he, he did it all the yeah. time. Um, yeah, like the the cast. I know we were ta- kind of talking about this one here, and um, I think this is that uh, this is probably like one of my last couple wins before we get into some criticisms, uh, if anything. Uh, you know, you got Martin uh, Mull, Don McGleason, Will Forte, Ben Campbell, John Clatt, Brad Morris. Um, you know, Rick Overton, Mark Metcalf. I, this the cast is Matt Lucas. I was actually just talking about him with my roommate uh, Thomas Lennon, which I thought was hilarious Thomas. in this. Oh Amazing. my gosh! Um, Matt look, Lucas was great. Natasha Leone. Oh yes, uh, it, like literally everybody that was in this actual movie and like all the other characters they had played. Even Ed Helms was in here for uh, for a moment. Seth yeah. Green also was in it too. Like it's it was a lot of fun. You can clearly see that they just put these people in there, but you know. I don't think that the all these characters was in this just just to make fun of the real people. They because a lot of these people are still alive to this day. So uh, I, th- I thought that was also a plays good a fantastic Tom Snyder. Yeah, and he yeah, and he was on the. I mean, that was the uh, the um, night show interview where he showed up like the magazine and everything. Um, we can't show the photo. What this photo? <laughs> yeah. and at the end you just hear them like they'll just about to cut them off and says come fuck yourself <laughs> uh, um, and whoever they got to play Ivan Reitman looked exactly like him to a T it was crazy I gotta, I'll look that up here um, as we're kind of go through this but uh, Lonnie Ross apparently 
So, <laughs> Joe Latruglia in this yeah. movie. It's going to be awesome. Um, any other wins before we get into our criticisms? Uh, those are the big ones I have for it. Cool. Uh, so, as always, things that uh, go well, sometimes they don't go well. So, Brylan, I'll let you boy of what's some things that you wanted you would do differently or some things you just didn't dig about this movie? Um, I think overall this movie just runs a little too short. And I would have put another half hour, maybe 45 minutes into it to kind of flush out the side characters, especially uh, Tom Lennon's Michael O'Donoghue, who's a key player into like the creation of the radio hour and the live stage performance was called the lemmings, even though they don't really mention it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I think he plays a pivotal role in national lampoon and, uh, he has some great moments like with the dynamite at his desk and talking about, I can bring a grenade to work if I want to. He's very super <laughs> unhinged. If you let him do his own thing, it's going to end up in probably an explosion or someone dying or something type of person and i definitely wanted to see a lot more of that because he is one of the more interesting characters uh, about the national lampoon Mm -hmm. um and uh i would say other than that um i would maybe appreciate uh just a little bit more um go into like the creative process of it uh let's see how the magazine is built and everything. Let's get a little bit more involved with uh, why is this magazine so important at the time it came out. Um, at one point, it was selling more than Time magazine, which is which is unheard of at that yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. And um, and why is it so important to society at that time as well? Yeah, I definitely have to agree with you for that. You know, the movie runtime was an uh, 101 minutes, so a little bit over an hour and a half. And I'm sure that's counting credits and all this sort of stuff. So once you shave that down, it's it's not that long. And it's interesting to see, you know, is this movie, you know, what is this movie trying to kind of invoke? Like, what do you, what sort of movie are you trying to tell? Is it a bit of a tribute? Is it a documentary? Is, are, uh, is it a call to action for something? Or... That's probably one of the biggest things that I would want because I, like you, I, w- I would want to make sure that this movie's longer so that we can kind of flush out some of these these things that it was kind of sort of glazed over. I didn't, I did hear them mention the Lemmings, but it we didn't see anything. It kind of went over. Um, they showed the radio show a little bit, and they kind of like glazed over that. Um, I'm glad that they kind of showed a lot of the times in which things was getting really difficult for Kenny. Um, and they just let they let the moment kind of sit there, especially him like falling asleep on his like falling asleep working, and takes a cigarette out. And it's something funny that you know Henry comes over, scratches out a joke, and says this one's funnier. But that sucks because the moment that we see right before there is Alex, his wife, just sleeping at home. Like what you know he's abandoning her um, for this beast that we talked about before that's way larger than he is. So if we can like at least kind of flush those moments out a little bit because we see Alex and I, th- I thought for sure there should be more. Um, uh, of a component in this movie but kind of like went through and then later on we see Catherine, who was definitely more of a force um it definitely kind of showed a little bit more of hey i, I think it would have been in- interesting to see if we would have had a bit more time they probably would have been able to talk about this a little bit more um i don't know if i know we were talking about this before of if I have so any other sort of criticisms about this movie, I'm glad that they really kind of set up a bunch of different things. My my only thing was, I didn't know, like I said before, that he was uh, passed, like he had died in, at all. So when they started with a narration of him, and this is modern day him, or kind of, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be very confused, because they're not, they're saying one thing, and then you're like, oh, whoops, you know. Um, and yeah, that could be another criticism that um, yeah, it's probably better not to know much about National Lampoon or Doug Kinney per se. Yeah, yeah. And, and watch this movie. Yeah, um, it'll definitely impact you a lot harder. Yeah, that way. It, I think like it literally. You're like pull. It, it, I think this that move right there really kind of affected me perfectly, as I'm sure that they planned, because you also see earlier in the movies that. Uh, uh, earlier in this movie, they would talk a joke, and he would always have to say, "Oh, this is not a bit. 
you know, and he wrote it down. He's like, this is not a bit. Um, and so sure enough that when we see that this character, he actually did, you know, he actually died. They never necessarily said anything about this is not a bit like that, that actually happened. And so I think that was another kind of interesting sort of component of it. It's like this crazy thing that this director, David Wayne. So I have much props to you, my friend. I, I still don't like your other work, but I like this one. Um, <laughs> I think that's really, really awesome for them to do that. And that's very fun. And that's very difficult to, for some people to kind of get behind. Uh, because some, a lot of people do know about like National Lampoon that's going to watch this movie. So, uh, but I think a lot of people who may not know that they see like Will Forte starring in a movie that's on Netflix, they could be pleasantly surprised. And they, and they do put a lot of different thing elements in this movie that makes it um, definitely enjoyable. Yeah, when I watch the first trailer and you see Mark Mole saying, I'm Doug Kenny, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> and I, nice. I still enjoyed it, even knowing, and I wouldn't say I'm a National Lampoon scholar or anything, but I know something about the history of it. Um, I, I still really enjoyed that narrative hook that okay. they used. Martin Mole, I mean, did a great job doing that, that, um, that it still is very impactful and makes the story more meaningful that way as yeah. well that hey yeah the national lampoon is here but this is more about doug kenny than anything i i love the fact that it's like in this what we were talking i had alluded to before a little bit of it wasn't just like a narration because a narration isn't a sentient character in an action in this movie because he quote like he broke the fourth wall, but at the same time he was the he was talking to himself as like the narrator and the character. They were conversing and they also say, Oh hey, by the way, this is the things that are happening and a lot of the things they were showing us on screen didn't really happen that way. So the fact that a person who's not normally there anyway narrating a movie about somebody who already had passed but showing us things that weren't there in the first place is starts to hurt my brain a little bit um <laughs> yeah. but that's like that's like a cr just craziness if, for somebody to think that oh like this would be a, a very cool moment uh, i think that'd be a pretty cool thing um so the the other thing i uh, also would say is i'm pretty sure a lot of people are going to watch this movie and it's like more of a it's not really a criticism but i'm interested about it is you know will's forte delivery and a lot of different things sometimes you can't tell when he's being serious or not and I'm glad they went with this approach because you don't, you just, you generally just don't know in this movie of like, does he get it? Does he not get it? Like, is he doing this bit? Is he not? Like, it, it was something not quite sort of there with Doug Kinney, was it? Um, so I'm glad they kind of went with that. Uh, but I also wonder, like, sometimes it's like, oh, Will Forte's character, we know who this character is. So it's really difficult to kind of step into this role. Um, so I'm glad they made a smart choice of just recasting everybody with all these celebrities. That's pretty cool. Um, but I'm wondering if it's going to have like a, a difficult sort of um, emotional backing for some some certain viewers and certain people who watch this movie. Yeah. So. And there's also some telling about the whole thing of him coming back every time he meets someone new or meets someone he's interested in about how he addressed himself in like that Harvard way that he learned. Where it's like Doug Kenning, Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Um, I think that was kind of like, um, kind of like the chain he was putting around his ankle and kind of keeping him tethered to home and mm -hmm. kind of keeping that chip on his shoulder at the same time mm -hmm. to give him the motivation to be something more. Yeah, it'll be. Uh, I, you know, I'm probably gonna go back and watch the other. Um, I think I may have seen that drunk, stupid, stoned, and yeah, drunk, stone, brilliant, dead. I think I may have seen that, but um, I definitely got to go back and kind of watch that just to see. Because if I see it, saw it, I don't remember it. So there you go. So I'm going to probably have to go back and kind of watch that because I'm pretty sure I'm going to enjoy that a lot too. Yeah. Any other criticisms, things that you didn't dig? Nope. So I'll leave it with some lasting thoughts here um, for uh, the movie that's on Netflix that we said, A Feudal and Stupid Gesture. Yep. I think this was a fantastic uh, dramatic retelling of Doug Kinney's life and about the creation of National Lampoon. Uh, uh, and I'm glad that it's a celebration, but also at the same time, it is very critical about uh, not only Doug, but also about uh, the pressure of create creativity as well. And about it can be a very tough thing to balance. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate how they 
balance those within this while using some very creative narrative elements to have a lot of fun and also be very serious at the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo some of those things. I'm just glad that they, like this movie and like that movement that they inspired, they tried to make a movie about it. And I'm not, I know a lot of people are going to be probably pissed off about this movie and about how they actually portrayed certain things. And I think that was the point. Um, so definitely I, I enjoy this movie a lot. I mean, as of 2018, as of right now, this is probably probably going to go down. We'll see, right? But I still think this is going to be in my top 10. Uh, well, obviously, like later on, we'll talk about it in November, December. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, still January. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I, but certain, like these sort of things just doesn't come out too often, uh, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously, like me not knowing anything about it is going to hit me more than somebody who loves Animal House and who loves Caddyshack, who loves Doug Henning's work, who loves National Lampoon, like that's going to hit them very, very differently. So it's going to be interesting to see it, how they perceive it. Uh, but for the person who doesn't watch trailers, uh, I thought it was awesome. I definitely recommend, I would definitely suggest kind of watching this. Um, even to the point where it, even if for one moment, like one iota of a second that you think, oh man, like I didn't, I never thought of it that way. I think that movie is going to, it, it literally accomplishes its goal just for that. Um, uh, and that's gonna it's that that carries a lot of weight from from what to come. Yep. So with that, we are excited to talk about more things and exciting things. But Brylan, where can we find more of your work? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brylan B R I L U N D. Um, I'm also gonna do many movie reviews on Instagram. Uh, at I am Brylan, I'll probably write a little brief about some more thoughts I have about a few little stupid gesture and put it up just because I want to put up the uh, National Lampoon uh, dog and revolver picture. I love it. It's so <laughs> oh, that's so good. I laughed so hard <laughs> at that moment. I thought it was amazing. Oh. Yeah. Um, and um, I am usually the host of the Down Front Games cast. Uh, take a little bit of hiatus uh, unless uh, some things change. Maybe. From some rumors, maybe there might be some Switch games coming Ooh. to the GameCast soon. Who knows? Uh, but you can find us there at twitch.tv slash uh, Down in Front Podcast. Warren and Mocha have been doing a great job filling in. Uh, Warren's been playing some Monster Hunter uh, World recently. That looks like a fun game. So much uh, fun. I would say is that I'm I'm definitely going to be on and hopefully a couple times this week. I just learned how nice. to catch monsters, and Ooh. it is not easy. Holy it's shit. But it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm I'm having a great time kinda of going through it and we'll pick up with Brometheus and his sidekick Mocha later on. Nice. Uh, and with, we are the Down in Front Podcast. Uh, double, definitely go check out a lot of our work. We have a beautiful, beautiful website that we have our Instagram uh, sort of live reactions. We have our YouTube channel. We have our streams. We actually have our uh, all the music that Michael Blewett makes for SoundCloud. We literally have like everything on there, downinfrontpodcast.com. That's where you're able to kind of get anything and everything to contact us, find out everything that we're necessarily doing, tweeting, and everything. So definitely go check it out. Uh, and uh, I know that one of the things that I'm really excited about is we are finally going to have a chance to do like another bonus episode for our Patreon or for our patrons. Uh, and so I'm going to be doing a uh, mini review of Paddington number one. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be video or audio, but I watched it because it has a, seven, a 97 or 98 percent online. And I'm excited to talk about it because I don't think it. Let's just say you're not giving it a 97. I'm not giving it a 97. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, if you definitely want to kind of support us, um, de definitely check it out. Patreon.com slash Down in Front Podcast. Um, anything and everything is super helpful, and we always, always would uh, be appreciative of it. So thank you so much. Uh, I would say good night, so long, farewell, have a drink, and enjoy your Sunday. And we will see One you later. Last thing. Yeah. Um, if if you want to talk about any inaccuracies that we've actually addressed in this uh, podcast, uh, you can send them to Jesse doesn't give a shit at whitemail.com. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Good night. Good night. Brown Roberts, Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs>